here we go. We have Chris Hansen, most known as the host of the infamous To Catch a Predator, also eight-time Emmy Award winner. Welcome to Vlad TV. Vlad, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Hey, long-time fan. Well, thank you. Long-time fan. Thank and, you. you know, I've told a lot of people that when I really formed Vlad TV 13 years ago, we didn't base it on the hip-hop news platforms. We based it on Dateline, 60 Minutes, these types of shows right. and this type of investigative journalism. And we try to emulate that. Well, you've done so well space. with it. Congratulations to you. I oh, mean, thank 13 you. years is thank great. You. You know? we, we try. Yeah, no, we it's try. awesome. Yeah. Well, this is our first time talking, so I want to get into your whole story. Sure. So you were born in Chicago. I was. Okay. And uh, you grew up in West Bloomfield? In Bloomfield Township, Michigan. Bloomfield, yeah. Township. Bloomfield Hills. It's all in the same area, so it's very close. Got it. And how's the upbringing? Up, upper class, middle class, did you have it rough? Very upper middle class, uh, never wealthy, um, very comfortable. My dad was in the auto industry in 1968. He was transferred from Chicago to Detroit. So we moved to the suburbs of Detroit. And it was just a very pleasant, comfortable, nothing fancy, but we enjoyed life. And I had two younger sisters and we lived in a nice colonial and a nice neighborhood and went to one of the best school systems in America and, and you know, pretty much were afforded everything you could expect out of life. I, we grew up on the periphery of wealth. You know, mm -hmm. I, I went to high school with people whose last names were Pulte and, you know, uh, people who were in the, in the automotive industry. But, you know, on my end, we had to work in the back of a bakery to pay for half of that tuition to go there. But we knew <laughs> that success was around us and it was out there, you know. Well, I guess when you were 14, uh, Jimmy Hoffa disappeared. Exactly. And you start following that whole investigation. It was fascinating to me as a young guy. I used to ride my bike up there and he was last seen and presumably kidnapped from a restaurant uh, about a mile and a half from uh, our home called the Red Fox. Ah. And um, I, just to check it out one day, rode my bike up there in 10 speed and there were FBI agents and local police and reporters from the local TV stations and network correspondents. And, and I really kind of got bit by the bug, fascinated by the whole thing at that time. Well, do you know who killed Jimmy Hoffa? <laughs> in 2021? I don't. You know, I've spent a fair amount of time covering it professionally and following it, you know, out of interest. And, you know, I saw The Irishman and I, I'm familiar with that particular theory. I mean, obviously it was mob related. The the mob didn't want him back in, in business. Uh, some of the movie, I think, rang very true based upon what I know. Um, some of it was you know, Hollywood, obviously. But uh, the story, if you listen to the FBI agents and you get a look at the files, basically, you know, they, they didn't want him back in power. And so they made him disappear. And, and how he died and where the body is, I think we'll never find a body because it was destroyed within hours of the kidnapping. And the mm. two leading theories are that it was a chromium dipping plate on Detroit's east side or a garbage... Uh, crunching facility in, in and around Hamtramck, which is a, an area right next to Detroit. Yeah. I mean, I've interviewed three mafia associates right. about the story and got three different stories. Completely different stories. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, Michael Franzese yeah. said he was buried somewhere wet. Yeah. Uh, Johnny Russo gave a whole different version of it. Um, Alan Gunner Lindblom, who's yeah. associated with the Detroit uh, mob, he gave a completely different story. He said he knows the guy who's responsible for killing him. They all said the Irishman was fiction. Yeah. But no one really said this is what happened and we still don't. Well, we, you're exactly right. And, and I agree with you. We had been involved in one of the wild goose chases at Dateline several years ago. I was doing a, a murder story that took place in suburban Detroit and a producer of mine came back and said, uh, hey, I was talking to this guy and the Southern Michigan prison in Jackson, he says he knows what happened to Hoffa. I said, well, well, you know, he and 6,000 other inmates, you tell him to give you something that no one else knows. And he does that. And he said, well, there's a body buried of another union official in a backyard in, in, uh, in near Saginaw, Michigan. And I said, all right. And we call the sheriff's department. They go to the house. They dig. There's a body. Oh, it's the guy. So I said, we'll get the Hoffa information. 
So we get that. I go to the then Oakland County prosecutor who went to the same high school I went to growing up in the same area. And I was a reporter in Detroit for 10 years before I went to New York. And I said, look, here's what we got. You know, I don't know if it's true. It sounds like something that should be investigated. And all I'm asking for is first crack when you go dig in the hole. And the story was that in the same backyard, a briefcase was buried that had a syringe and playing cards used by Hoffa's kidnappers. The syringe used to sedate him. And theoretically, there'd be DNA on the syringe and the playing cards of the kidnappers. When okay. we get out there, turns out to be, you know, false, nothing there, and another wild goose chase. Gotcha. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, you go to Michigan State University. Correct. You graduate. Yep. And then you become a reporter. Correct. Uh, I guess you started uh, at WILX in Lansing, Michigan. Uh, you went to Tampa. Uh, you went to Detroit. Uh, and then in 1993, you joined NBC. Was that the big time for you? It was very exciting. Yeah, it was huge. I mean, um, the first job was at a news magazine called Now, which was anchored by Tom Brokaw and Katie Couric. And I was one of the correspondents. And about a year into it, uh, it merged with Dateline. And so uh -huh. I became a correspondent with Dateline. But they, NBC ultimately decided it didn't want two news magazines competing against each other, which made sense. I mean, during the OJ uh, you know, uh, situation, you had now knocking on one door and Dateline knocking on another. And so why are we having competitors within the same network news organization? You know, so they put us all into Dateline. What was it like working with, uh, with Tom Brokaw and uh, Katie Kirk? Because those are two legends. Loved them. Absolutely loved them. That was a, a year of just, uh, you know, figuring out as we went along what that news magazine was going to be. We had nothing on the shelf, no library. And so it was part of my job to get launched out of a cannon weekly to go cover whatever breaking news there was, uh, whether it was the poly class murder in Petaluma, California, or something happened with the Unabomber, or something happened, you know, in some other breaking news. I would literally get on a plane Saturday, work Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, the show would be on at 9 p.m., go to the staff meeting on Thursday, collapse for Friday, Saturday, and get ready to get on a plane again. But it was it was exhilarating. It was great. It was, it was wonderful to work with everybody. Jeff Zucker was the executive producer and um, a great, great guy to work for. Well, you covered the Columbine uh, High School massacre. You also covered the Oklahoma City bombing. Yeah. Which is the biggest domestic terrorism incident still ever. Still 168 people. My son now, my second son, is now a television reporter in Oklahoma City. Mm. And his apartment looks down on that that uh, memorial. It's for, to have been there in 1995 and covered it and to go back today to visit him. It's It brings back every every emotion, every memory of covering what I thought then would be the worst disaster, the worst terrorist attack I would ever see in my lifetime. Well, you actually exposed that there was a group that was linked to Osama bin Laden was trying to buy nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. So you actually uncovered that. We did, along with uh, one of my producers. We um, um, had access to a federal investigation and to an informant who worked in that investigation, a guy named Randy Glass, no longer with us, who went undercover and was posing as somebody who could sell Stinger missiles. And some of the people caught up in that were um, tied into and worked for uh, Pakistani intelligence, which we knew at that time had ties to Al Qaeda and other terrorist groups. And you know, we broke the story of how they were going to buy Stinger missiles. And there was a meeting in New York in which one of the buyers with ties to terrorism said, see those buildings pointing over to the World Trade Center? And this was before 9-11. If I get the right weapons, those are coming down. We're chilling looking back. And those guys all got arrested? Some got arrested. Some are still on the lam uh, in the Middle East. You know, going through these types of, you know, high profile cases, were you ever threatened, uh, intimidated? Anyone ever put hands on you? That type of thing? Felt like your life was going to end or? Not to the extent where I knew at least that, you know, something was going to happen. In Detroit as a reporter, you know, uh, a wiretap surfaced where a drug gang had 
said it wanted to pay $1,000 or $10,000 to a crack addict to kill me because I was getting close to their investigation, their their operation. Um, in the predator investigations, you know, we've had a couple moments that mm -hmm. looking back were pretty tense, but nothing that I'm aware of where, you know, I was in a safe house for, you know, two months in the witness protection program or anything like that. You know, I, I think... I think if, if somebody's, there's threats all the time, but if somebody's really going to do something, they're not going to call you ahead of time or text you and say, we're coming to get you. That's intimidation. Yeah. You know? Well, then in 2004, uh, To Catch a Predator. Yes. Who came up with that name? The name I'm trying to think was, it was a combination of people in a production meeting. Originally, when we did the first one, it was called Dangerous Web. And then it just was a combination of the senior investigative producer, myself, the producer, and our boss at the time, our executive producer, David Corvo. And To Catch a Predator just seemed like a good name for it, and it stuck immediately. So that's what it was. Okay. And, and this was something very different. Way different. On television. Completely There was different. nothing like this leading up to this show. So I guess volunteers would impersonate minor children. 13 to 15 year olds Correct. in chat rooms. Correct. And they would agree to meet with adults for sex. Correct. So I had become aware of a group called Perverted Justice, which was an online watchdog group through a reporter friend of mine in Detroit who took my job when I left. And I started to think if we could work with them and use their ability to pose as 13, 14 year old kids, 15 year old kids online, and use our ability to wire a house and really embed in this crime, it could be compelling. And so I pitched the story. And it wasn't meant to be a completely different show. It was meant to be, you know, a segment for Dateline. And so I pitched it and, you know, a lot of smart people weighed in on it. And we did it 17 years ago, literally last week in Bethpage, Long Island. Okay. So you guys get this house. Mm-hmm. And there is a, a child impersonator, basically, in the house? We had, in the first investigation, two members of Perverted Justice. One, uh, a young woman who could pose as a boy or a girl. <laughs> and uh, um, she would be the on-site decoy. Now, they, the whole group, Perverted Justice, had people online existing in chat rooms. Now, remember, Vlad, at that time, we only used... AOL and Yahoo chat rooms. That's right. all there was. Right. So that was where we went. And they posed, they set up a profile with a picture that was unmistakably underage. It was very clear. There were guidelines. You couldn't bring up the, you couldn't make the first approach. In other words, these decoys couldn't go to guys and say, hey, I'm 14, but I want to have sex with you. <laughs> it right. just exists there with the profile. They were hit upon by the guy. Okay. The guy brought up the subject of sex. The child was obviously open to it. And the meeting was set. If the guy came over, before we got involved, Perverted Justice would merely post the ID in the picture on the, their website. When we got involved, they became characters in the show. Okay. But the person in the house is over 18. Correct. Okay. Pretending to be a, a 13 year old. Correct. Got it. The man arrives to the house mm -hmm. for sex. And then you walk in. So. You've done the show a bunch of times, but the first time, here you are, this strange man is walking into a house, briefly meets with this underage girl who says she's going to go in the back and, you know, freshen up. And then an adult man comes in mm -hmm. to confront this guy who has no idea this is about to happen. No clue. Tell me that first time that you did that. My heart was in my throat. Uh, we had gone through a bunch of potential scenarios. We had security there. Ron Knight, my security guy, was there. Uh, I had the transcripts. The guy came in, goes to the counter, and I walk out and immediately start the conversation. What are you doing here? And I don't say right away, I'm Chris Hansen with Dateline NBC, because I want to know what this guy is about. Now, like you said, I didn't have all this perfected in the first investigation. So I'm just trying to keep it together. Right. I got a guy across from me in a kitchen 
who's rangy at best, who doesn't know whether I'm a cop, the mad dad <laughs> right. who walked in, or option number three, which they probably didn't think of in that first investigation, Chris Hansen of Dateline NBC. <laughs> right. So the first guy comes in, I keep it together, we have the discussion, and he leaves. Second guy comes in, same thing happens. The third guy comes in, and now it's getting chaotic because it's all happening all at the same time. And the transcripts of the chats are laid out on the dining room table. They're all mixed up. So I grab the wrong transcript for the third guy. And I go, at one point I said, well, it says right here that you want to do this, this, and this with a 12-year-old named Susan. No, that's not me. Excuse me. Walk back out. Got a second set of transcripts. <laughs> a 14-year-old named Diane. No, that's not me. Third set of transcripts. A 13-year-old named Beth. Yes, that's me. Okay, great. Let's continue. And we went into the interview. He stuck around while you're getting he did. transcripts? He did. And it turned out this guy, and I remember distinctly, his screen name was Dark Hero 73 And I just did a podcast on him, Predators I've Caught is, is the podcast. And we got into his segment and he really got aggressive. And when people say, well, was there a time when you really thought that you were potentially in danger. Thinking back, he was one of the you know top potentially dangerous guys. And it turned out that he had a restraining order against him by a former girlfriend, that he had just gotten out of a mental institution. And while I'm not suggesting there's a link between predatory behavior and mental illness, clearly you've got somebody who is potentially unstable and could have done something harmful to a uh, 13-year-old girl had there been a 13-year-old girl there. Okay. Were the police involved from the first episode or no? The police were not involved in the first two episodes. Okay. It wasn't until the third episode. So you basically contacted police and said, hey, we're about to do this. Be waiting outside to arrest this guy. We did not in the first two investigations. We just did the investigation. We didn't know what we'd find. You just let the guy walk out. The guy just left, okay. which was obviously we came to the conclusion that this was very unfulfilling from a television production standpoint. And more important, you know, it wasn't socially responsible. I mean, here you've got a guy who commits a crime. And in, in some of these cases, in the first two investigations, there were charges filed. Uh -huh. The police stepped in, in in the first one afterwards after the fact. Yeah. So there was a there was a, a firefighter who surfaced in the first investigation. He was prosecuted by the feds. In the second one, we had the rabbi and a number of others who surfaced, and they were prosecuted. But it was after the fact by in the rabbi's case the FBI, and in the other cases the Fairfax County Police Department. Okay, but then the police got involved in the third one. In the third one, we had been contacted by the Riverside County Sheriff's Department. And the Sheriff's Department was willing to do an investigation parallel to our investigation. So that was the first time that law enforcement was involved. Okay. And were a lot of the people prosecuted from that? Yes. They were all prosecuted. 51 guys surfaced in three days. When the, when the police showed up, how badly did the people start to panic? Oh, they're, they're very panicked because imagine we have this house in Riverside. It's a good sized house, probably a five bedroom house. They come in. Now, this is the third time we've done it, right? So some of the guys actually are starting to recognize me. Not many in that case, but some. And they go through this interrogation, this interview with me, and then they leave. They walk out the door and a team of sheriff's deputies grab him and take him to a nearby motorhome. That's how we did that case. And he was interrogated in the motorhome, and then a police car, sheriff's car, took him away for processing. So it got so busy in that particular investigation. I mean, imagine 51 guys showing up in three days mm -hmm. that guys were being arrested as other guys were showing up. And so okay. they would call the decoy and say, hey, I see the police outside, what's going on? And the decoy would say, well, there was just a pot bust. There was a loud party next door. Don't worry about it. Come back in five minutes. The guy came uh -huh. back. Okay. I didn't realize that all these shows were being done in the same day like that, one after another. Well, each guy, yeah. you know, was, was a segment. 
yeah. but, but are a part of a segment. But yeah, I mean, we would continue if, you know, we would go from 10 o'clock in the morning till as late as guys would show up. And so however many guys showed up, that's what the production schedule was. And it obviously was fluid and changed and we had to be flexible. So the show started in 2004. Mm-hmm. And there were 12 investigations across the U.S. But then in 2008, there was a show with a guy named Lewis Conrad, mm-hmm. uh, an assistant district attorney Correct. Uh, in Texas. Tell me about that situation. We had done this investigation in Texas. And about the second night into it, a guy had surfaced chatting with a 13-year-old boy. He did not show up at the house, but in Texas, the actual chat itself uh, constituted solicitation of a child. And so the next day, the police department um, goes to his door. He's an assistant district attorney and goes to arrest him. He has a handgun in the house. And as the police are moving in, he takes the handgun and shoots himself in the head, sadly committing suicide. What was found out later was on his laptop were at least 10 images of child pornography for which he knew as a district attorney, assistant district attorney, he would face in Texas 10 years in prison per image. Mm. And while you don't want to see anything like that happen to a guy, suicide, um, you could pretty much clearly assume that he didn't want to face the music on that and chose to take his own life. How did you feel when you found out that he died? It was, you know, a difficult moment for everybody involved. You don't want to see somebody do that. I don't feel responsible for it. I sleep well at night and did after the fact. We completely reported on it the next morning. You know, the, the obviously the Predator episode didn't air for some time, but the next morning I was on the Today Show, first thing from Texas, laid it out exactly. We're completely transparent about everything that happened and reported on it. Well, then uh, his sister, mm-hmm. Patricia, ended up suing NBC. Correct. Saying that the police had raided uh, the house on behest of NBC. And then a judge actually, well, threw out most of the case, Mm -hmm. but there was one claim that the judge allowed. So explain to me what happened in that case. So the judge, in several lawyers' opinions, went outside the four corners of the case and considered things that our lawyers didn't think should have been considered. But, you know, when a federal judge does that, you can appeal, but it it the case moves on to the next level. Mm-hmm. So they were preparing to go to trial, and um, NBC at the time made the decision to settle the case before trial. Do you know how much for? I don't know the exact number, to be honest with you. It was a minor percentage of what the initial number was. And the number, when you file a lawsuit, you attach a number. It, it means nothing. $20 million, whatever. $150 yeah. million, whatever yeah, the number whatever, was. Yeah. But, but there's a settlement for, you know, a, a minuscule part of that. And, the th- and nobody was crazy about that. You know, nobody liked that. They were ready to go to trial. And, and I'm convinced that we would have won a trial. But ultimately, the decision was made that they didn't want to have me tied up for three months. They didn't want to have the other people tied up for three months. And when you settle a lawsuit like that, the settlement comes out of an insurance policy. If you Mm -hmm. go to trial, the money comes out of the news budget. Uh A trial is much more expensive than a settlement. So while the settlement was absolutely not palatable to us at the time, I think everybody involved grew, if not comfortable, okay with it. Well, I guess the judge had ruled that Patricia had a reasonable chance of proving that NBC had pressed police into engaging in unreasonable and unnecessary tactics solely for entertainment value, thus creating a substantial risk of suicide or other harm. Uh, They also found that the police disregarded their duty to prevent Conrad from killing himself and that NBC's actions uh, amounted to conduct so outrageous and extreme that no civilized society should tolerate it. The interesting thing about that, and think about this for a minute, we had no control over when they were going to do the the arrest. So uh, I know a lot has been said about, oh, they were trying to hurry up and get it done because, you know, NBC had to go elsewhere on, on 
Sunday night or Monday morning, and it just wasn't true. I mean, the reality was this. Had they decided to arrest him the next day at his office, at the district attorney's offices, that would have been arguably much better from a television production standpoint and more dramatic mm. than going to a house and knocking on a door. So, Were your cameras there when they knocked on the door? Yes, they were. Ah, got it. So, and again, we didn't control what the police were doing. We were there covering it, obviously, as any yeah. journalist would do if you were involved in such an endeavor. But we didn't have a hand in saying, you need to go to his house right now, force the issue right now versus, you know, arresting him on the street or at his office or anything like that. The part that always seemed somewhat interesting to me was in this particular case, in this show, these men are being arrested for attempting to have sex with a minor. Mm -hmm. But in fact, the person is over 18 and just impersonating a minor. So although I do not condone this type of thing at all and believe that these type of men should be put away, but in this particular case, aren't they technically not breaking the law? They're just dealing with an impersonator. Well, they're technically breaking the law because the law and the courts have upheld that sting operations are viable and, and constitutional. It's like if somebody does a cocaine bust okay. and they use fake cocaine for uh -huh. part of it. Okay, I got um, it. Or counterfeit money or illegal arms that are you know not uh, functional for, for the purposes of a demonstration or a sting operation. So it's the intent to commit the crime that counts. And you know that it's not like the um, the predator can argue that well I knew it was an adult and I was just testing it. I mean uh -huh. they've argued that. But that's not, I mean <laughs> sure it doesn't wash. <laughs> I mean I know better. You know better. The police know. Better. Okay, got it. Yeah, I was just yeah. wondering how the law works. No, that's that's exactly how it works. So okay, well ultimately because of the suicide, the show got canceled. That's not exactly true. We went on after that and did a number of other shows. Now ultimately. NBC made the decision not to do new productions. But I think it had more to do, and I'm not saying the suicide had nothing to do with it. I'm sure there were considerations about, okay, if this could happen, what could happen next? I wasn't in on those meetings. What I can tell you is that the production became very expensive. And what NBC figured out is that they had a lot of material that could be repackaged, repurposed, and re-aired for many years to come without the expense of having to go out and shooting another one and getting ratings and attention and generating profits without doing another investigation. Aha. Okay. I mean, were you upset mm -hmm. when the show was ultimately canceled? You know, it was, I thought we could go do more. I was ready to do some other topics at the time, quite honestly. Um, <clears throat> it was one of those shows that became iconic for a lot of different reasons. Um, I was attached to it. Um, there were a lot of other things I want to do. You know, it's, I'm known for this, but it's still two, three, four, five percent of my portfolio in reporting. Out of all the Emmys, none of them are for Predator. I'm not saying it wasn't Emmy worthy. Oh, you weren't getting all the Emmys for To Catch a Predator? No, everything else. Ah, okay. I didn't yeah. know that. So, you know, I was game to do some other topics, uh, which I was doing all along anyway. Mm -hmm. it, it, again, it's 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 become iconic for all the reasons we know. It's important for all the reasons we know, but it, you know, is a small portion of what I did at twenty years at NBC. Well, in two thousand ten, uh, one of my all time favorite shows, The Boondocks, <laughs> did an episode right called The Booty Warrior. It's uncomfortable, <laughs> uh, where you were actually a character. Yes. On that show. Yes, I was. You watched it? I, I've seen it, yeah. Uncomfortably, I've watched it, yeah. Okay. I could play it again for you. Oh, I, I know what's in there. Yeah. You know what's in there. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, this character is actually based on uh, this guy named Fleece Johnson. Right. Who was uh, a, a gay man in prison who uh, forcibly, uh, you know, raped other men right. in prison. And... Uh, they basically took that little viral clip right. and they they reenacted it with uh, the Booty Warrior. Yes. Where uh, you come in and uh, instead of you catching a predator, he was actually 
wanting you. Right. Exactly. <laughs> Called you Chris exactly. Handsome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, basically had his way with you before the before the police showed up. Well, as it so happens, and I don't I don't know how this actually occurred, but um, Fleece Johnson actually got released from prison. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I guess he knew that you were coming on the show. So he, he recorded a little message for you. <laughs> Would you like to hear it? Sure. I'm still a warrior, Chris. <laughs> and guess what? I'm out of prison. And you fired. So we both ain't got nothing but time on our hands, Chris. <laughs> I'm going to tell you like this here. I still like you and I still want you. <laughs> now we can do this the easy way or the hard way. The choice is yours. I, I don't care about Vlad's little cameras. Cause I'm a warrior, Chris. I'm still a warrior. <laughs> well, got some bad news. <laughs> it's not going to fly. <laughs> uh, shout out to Carl Jones. He actually did the voice oh, that's of, funny. of uh, the Booty Warrior on the Boondocks. Oh, and, that's funny. Uh, you Ooh. know, we went ahead and had him do a, a new segment. That's awesome. That's funny. <laughs> Just for you. <laughs> I was actually uh, a character on the show as well. On ah. the episodes. Yep. Yep. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's funny because uh, obviously there were a number. The Simpsons did something and um, Family Guy and, and uh, one evening I was on here on the West Coast working on a story and my one of my agents texts me and says, uh, South Park is doing you tonight. Mm. It's pretty funny. I said, well, that's great. I'll, in three hours, I'll watch it. And 20 minutes later, he says, it's taken a dark turn. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it was funny because at the time, the two older boys were in high school, my sons. And, um, you know, they went to high school on the East Coast where kids had dads who were, you know, involved in the movie industry, involved in mm -hmm. Wall Street, and so they have a dad on TV is, you know, no big deal. Yeah. But when I was on South Park, suddenly I was cool. And I was the coolest <laughs> dad there. Well, uh, you had been married for a long time, uh, two sons, like you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And then in 2011, uh, it was exposed that you were having an affair uh, with a woman that was 22 years younger than you, uh, Kristen Cadell, am I pronouncing it right? I believe so. Yeah. Number one, who exactly was following you and and capturing? Because I guess there was uh, some video of the it two was, of you. There was a you're, what you're referring to is a tabloid story that got legs for a couple of weeks, and so much of it was inaccurate and wrong, and um, people had a little bit of a heyday with it, but it was. Uh, you know, I've said everything I'm going to say on it. You know, it was, you know, it was a National Enquirer story and it had all the credibility of a National Enquirer story. It was mm. a moment caught that was taken out of context and, and much more was made of it than was worthy, I believe. Well, then in 2013, there was a photo that surfaced of the two of you kissing. And then it was announced that you're going to be let go. Uh, from Dateline, well, from NBC. Was it over that photo? No, the, the, the two things had nothing to do with each other. You know, look, Dateline was going in a different direction. I was there doing a lot of investigative stuff, but also the murder stuff. And, you know, there was discussion about different roles and different things. And I had the opportunity to do a lot of different things at that time. And and so to to, to suggest the two were linked would not, it's just not true. Okay. And, uh, you know, the woman, she wrote an open letter at one point, said that uh, she can't find a job anymore and her career was ruined and, and everything else like I'm that. I'm not familiar with it all. I mean, people yeah. say people say a lot of things when they, they're they desperate and, and people could say what they want. I'm, I'm comfortable with um, the way I dealt with it. How did your wife take it? You know, uh, it wasn't a big issue in my life. It just wasn't. Okay. Were you guys separated at that point? We, we're divorced now. Uh -huh. Were and, you divorced in 2018? Uh, we've been legally separated for quite some time before the divorce. Ah, okay. Got it. I mean, a lot of people felt like it was karma to a certain degree. Here mm, you are. I don't buy into any of that. Look, I mean, you know, people people who live public lives, you know this. People say <laughs> that you're an informant for the FBI. Right. That's, I'm guessing exactly. that's probably not true. So, <laughs> right. you know, people talk a lot of smack and... You know, when you reach that level, 
the lesson I think is that at least for me, you have to make sure that you completely conduct yourself in, in the appropriate way. Because if you do find yourself like a little too much fun or hang out with people maybe you shouldn't be hanging out, you create the opportunity for somebody to 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 say something or do something, true or not, that could be misconstrued or, or that can make the tabloids. And that's, you know, nobody needs that. I mean, was it a hit piece from the Inquirer? Was it like yes, a, it was a revenge? Yes, so much of it was wrong. I, I don't think it was revenge. I think, I think it was, um, you know, somebody took advantage of a situation and made it look like something it wasn't. And that's the end of it. Got it. Well, I guess in 2015, you had a new show called Hanson versus Predator. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I guess 10 people were arrested? 11. 11 people were arrested. What was the, the premise of this show? It was very similar to To Catch a Predator. It was um, rebranded. It was something I wanted to do. I thought we could... Uh, uh, we hadn't done a predator investigation for a number of years, and I thought it was time to go out and do it. So we produced it, and it became a part of Crime Watch Daily, which is a syndicated show that I hosted and reported for for a couple of years. Well, I guess some of the people who were arrested, there was a former mailman who bought a chips and iced tea to the decoy for attempting to hug her. Man drove two hours from Boston. Yeah. Jeff Sokol. Uh, with a pizza, the a pizza real estate guy. broker who you actually knew. I didn't know him well, but it was interesting because when I walked out and the guy looked so familiar. And when I came out, he said, Chris, no, Chris, no, it's not what it looks. And and I knew I knew him from somewhere. And the, the rest of the crew thought, well, he just knows over television. But he ended up being a fellow who rode the commuter train, who I knew uh, just from the train back and forth between Connecticut and New York. So, yeah, mm -hmm. this was a fellow that, that I had met and talked to before. Well, the most serious one was an army vet Correct. who tried to get uh, the girl into his car. Yeah. And when the police showed up, he had a loaded gun, a knife, and duct tape in his mm -hmm. trunk. So he was ready for an all-out kidnapping. You know, you had to wonder, had it been a 13-year-old girl there and not us, that ends in a whole different way. Mm. You know, and this is Fairfield, Connecticut, so it's not like we're in some horrible area. And it doesn't matter what area we're in. We can be in, in lower class, middle class, upper class. You're going to get people. We did one, you know, just weeks ago in Michigan for a new series, a Predator wow. series. And again, we had a uh, Michigan prison guard. We had a guy who worked in the auto industry. We had a guy who was a cop in Lebanon. We had uh, a babysitter. I mean, a guy who had done work in the governor's home, the same mm -hmm. governor who was targeted in a kidnapping plot. I mean, this, this is still going on and, and, and it's become more prevalent, I think, because there are so many more platforms, social media platforms, uh, where predators can potentially approach children. And think about the pandemic for a year now. I don't know if you have kids or not, but every kid has been doing everything online, mm -hmm. whether it's interactive gaming or whether it's communicating or seeking entertainment. And predators have more chances to approach kids than ever before. And while everybody's at home, potentially parents you would think would have the, a greater ability to monitor this, they're busy doing, trying to do what they do in their computers. So there's a tendency to not see everything that's going on. And all the men were arrested? Now, were you actually showing up the way you were on To Catch a Predator? Oh, yeah. It was, it was basically the same thing. Okay, so when they see you... They recognize you and they're like, shit. <laughs> some some do and some don't. I okay. mean, we had a guy in that particular investigation, the one you're talking about, where I said, uh, I'm Chris Hansen. He said, no, you're not. I said, yeah, I am. No, you're not. I said, it hasn't been that many years. I, have, I don't look that different. You know, <laughs> It's me. Trust me. You're about to find out. Okay. And how many years were some of these guys getting? In... Total, I think the highest sentence was 24 years. And that was big because of a you know prior history of this kind of conduct. On the low end, um, you know, guys got probation, uh, monitoring, registration as a sex offender. But the vast majority, and I mean the vast, vast majority of cases either ended in a, a guilty plea, no contest plea, or a conviction by a jury or a judge. Only a couple of cases in the Texas investigation, the prosecutor declined to, 
to go after the cases, and that was more of a political reason than a criminal reason. But once police did a parallel investigation, virtually all the cases were prosecuted successfully. Have you ever run into any of the guys that you helped put away? No, and that's an interesting question. Um, no. And I've reached out to some of them for interviews. Aha. Um, what kind of answers did you get for those guys? Mixed. I, you know, nobody has really offered to sit down and do it. <laughs> but I've had conversations. Uh, there's one fellow, Lance uh, or, uh, Lorne, um, and he is uh, he's become famous in the in the predator to catch a predator following community, Lauren Armstrong, and like ten thousand people follow this guy and what he's done since he was arrested in Kentucky in Bowling Green, Kentucky. He's a child predator. He he was arrested in the to catch a predator investigation. He's a, a social media Lauren Armstrong yeah. celebrity now. <laughs> and he's he's wow. got they okay. have he said oh cod was his. He kept saying it over and over again, meaning, oh, God, but he said it with a main accent. And so now there's this church of cod, C-A-W-D, with thousands and thousands of followers okay. who, who keep track of Lauren Armstrong. Uh, okay. That's, that's weird. <laughs> uh, you never worry about these guys coming back to go after you, you know, maybe, bl you know, because clearly it's their, it's their own fault. Right. It was their own action. They did it, but and got there, but blame ultimately, those who 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 brought attention to them. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I concern. I take precautions. You know, I'm not crazy, but um, you know, I, I I'm not unmindful that that could happen. Yeah. Well, uh, in 2016, you did a, a Kickstarter uh, campaign uh, for a new show that you were going to do. Um, you were trying to raise four hundred thousand. You only raised eighty nine thousand. So I guess there was supposed to be some memorabilia that was supposed mm -hmm. to be sent out to the people who uh, contributed, and then uh, things started to go wrong. It all got taken care of. I mean, I think the lesson there is that you, you know, if you're going to have a business with your name on it, you have to have the right people operating it. And if you're not that kind of a businessman, then you really need to pay close attention to it. And and there were some some people involved in it who didn't get the job done. Ultimately, it got done, and the stuff went out, and the vendors got paid, and, and everything. But yeah, it, it was a bit of a bit of a mess for a minute. Well, you got arrested, I guess, for uh, uh, paying for a, a check that ended up bouncing. A guy who worked with me had issued a check that that was returned and had to be rectified and it was all rectified. Okay. But then your you know, your mugshot is now being plastered all it, over. It could have been it could have been handled so much better mm. in hindsight. But yeah. it was all handled. And um, you know, the lesson is if something's got your name attached to it, you need to be attentive to it. Um, that certainly will never happen again. Well then in two thousand nineteen it was reported that you got evicted for failing to pay rent in, in Manhattan. Yeah, that was I mean, there was a landlord tenant issue that got resolved again. It, it, it was much more was made of it than actually deserved uh, attention. But, but once again, here you are <laughs> on on TMZ and, and these types of publications. Uh, does it get annoying sometimes that a it's, lot of the stuff th that's look, kind of I th personal? I think I think I think there was um, you know just a short period of time where uh, there was a ton going on. It all got resolved, and you know you move past it. And, uh, you know, things are in a really good place now. There are a lot of projects going and, and uh, you know, it's, it's all in the past. Well, there was a situation where you were investigating a guy named o Onision? Yes. So tell me the story with that. So I started to explore the um, YouTube space and we had done some shows and stories and it was strongly suggested to me by a number of other content creators that I should investigate Onision, uh, Gregory James Jackson, who was very popular, had a big channel, and had a big following amongst young women. And the allegation was that he had uh, preyed upon them, taken advantage of them, had inappropriate sexual contact with some of them, um, then engaged in bullying and harassing behavior. So we had a lot of those victim survivors on the show, and, and it became it got a lot of attention. And ultimately, we did a, a series 
called Onision in Real Life, which just came out on Discovery Plus, and that's out right now, um, which is fascinating and very much worth uh, worth watching. Well, uh, YouTube ended up suspending his channel. It did, demonetizing his channel. Yeah, yeah uh, indefinitely. Correct. Uh, he ended up, uh, I guess, filing charges against you? Not charges. He he. We went out there about a year ago to get his side of the story, and we knew that he had been living away from his house, and we tried to find him for an interview, and ultimately I did a, I knocked on his door, and mm. we had a television crews out there with us. And I could hear him, and he called the sheriff's department, and, and you know, look, he didn't answer the door, he didn't want to talk, fine, I'd back off. I've done hundreds of door knocks in my life. It's not a new concept. Okay. And so the sheriff's department shows up, I explain what happened, they go interview him, everybody leaves and goes on their way. We used the video on the YouTube channel. Ultimately, it was also used in the in the series that's now on Discovery Plus. He went to court filing his own motion for some sort of restraining order, and it was dismissed. It was, uh, you know, is one of uh, the goofiest things I've ever seen. And, and uh, well, you've done hundreds of door knocks, and you know, people get on me for the, the type of questions that I ask. People call me the feds and the police and, and so forth. Right. Because in the hip hop space, right. you know, hard journalism isn't has never been a thing. But I don't know if I could bring myself to actually knock on someone's door. Just simply because of the, the danger aspect of it. Because behind that door, you don't know what type of weapons exactly. a person is holding. Well, you, you have to, you know, do some research. You have to be prepared if something does happen. That's why in Detroit, you learn to knock you know, on from the other side of the door because okay. that's brick and that's wood. So if something comes through the wood, you're behind the brick. Right. I mean, you know, if someone knocks on my door that I'm not familiar with, I may have my pistol in my hand. I mean, I, I've done it before, actually. <laughs> I've, I've had my pistol in my hand when I've some strange person's knocked on my door. Luckily, nothing's ever happened. But what came out of that door knock, though, were dozens and dozens of law enforcement reports about events that had taken place at that house, including the near death of the couple's two-year-old child, mm. who, with both parents home, Onision, Gregory James Jackson, and his spouse, fell out of a second-story window where the child was severely injured. And it was noted in the police report that Greg Jackson oddly took a video of the child before rendering assistance and continued to have texts with young followers in the whole process of taking the child to the hospital. Ah. So there were also other complaints and, and um, police runs to the house. It, was, it, it, it opened a whole new view into what was happening there too. So I think, I, I know what you're saying about a door knock and, and sometimes you need to, to go the extra mile to talk to somebody. Now he spins this whole misinformation campaign about no trespassing and this and that. And you know the, the guy wouldn't know the truth if it hit him on the side of the head. He's delusional, dangerous. So you could legally knock on someone's Absolutely door? Absolutely you can. Why not? If they ask you to leave and don't come back, you leave and don't come back. Hmm. I mean, you know, you have to do it appropriately. Okay, uh, and it, but it's it's a time honored journalistic tradition. Well, your newest show is an investigation on Peter Nygaard. Correct. And I've been hearing about this guy for years, yep. way before he got arrested recently. Mm -hmm. And I had heard that he would have girls and everything else like that. I, I never heard about the underage thing, to be honest. Um, you know, probably because of the circles <laughs> right. that I go have nothing to do with that. So I never heard that. So when I heard about all the underage stuff, it was like, oh, okay, like this is way more serious. This, this, I just thought it was some old guy who just liked a lot of girls around. Um, but ultimately, there were some really interesting stories about abortions. Can you explain that? He was obsessed, Peter Nygaard was. Uh, with stem cell research and anything that he could get his hands on to preserve his health and youth and to create longevity. And according to many people involved in the investigation, he actually would impregnate underage girls, uh, have them get abortions, and then harvest the stem cells of the fetuses to inject in himself under the belief that it would be more beneficial than random stem cells from another source. Uh, and that he would go to China and other countries to learn how to do this and have it done. And the underage aspect of this is 
you know, a big part of the investigation too. Um, but that's part of it. That's how far he would allegedly go to extend his life and his lifestyle. Well, he's 79 years old Correct. right now. So he felt that injecting stem cells from aborted fetuses mm -hmm. from women that he impregnated himself would somehow keep him alive longer. Correct. And he kept doing that over and over again. He did a lot of things. I mean, this is a guy, Vlad, who is being investigated for sexual assault going back five decades involving potentially thousands of women uh, in Canada, in California, in the Bahamas where he had a compound, where he would routinely, according to witnesses, take underage girls, drug them, get them drunk, seduce them, and rape them in a most vile and vicious fashion. And we went down to the Bahamas, it's been a year now, and interviewed a lot of the victims, the survivors, and some of the people who were witnesses. And he was able to get away with this for so long because of wealth and corruption and a sense of impunity uh, like I've never seen. And I've covered a lot of criminal cases in 40 years. Right, because he's worth $900 million. Correct. He's got a fashion empire. Correct. And uh, I guess he has a, a big compound in the Bahamas? It's amazing. He is right next door to a fellow named Louis Bacon, who's a billionaire hedge fund guy. And this part of the investigation, at least the Bahamas part of it, began over a battle over beachfront property. <laughs> the stuff that Nygaard was doing upset Bacon. Bacon filed motions. Nygaard filed motions. It got nasty. The stuff that Nygaard did to paint Bacon as this horrible human being in this misinformation campaign. It was just wild. But ultimately, you know, Bacon was able to fund an investigation that unearthed evidence. Wow. That was given to the federal government that led to an indictment and a prosecution by the Human Trafficking Task Force of Southern New York and Manhattan. And that indictment was unsealed and Nygaard was arrested in Winnipeg, where he's being held now without bail, pending extradition to the United States. Right, and he's 79. 79. So whatever amount of years he gets, there's a reasonable chance he's going to die in prison. Correct. And I'm told by sources, and, and uh, we did a, a, a series of interviews for a show that's coming out on my YouTube channel on Nygaard, that you know because he's not getting the supplements and the vitamins and the injections that he's used to getting, that he's literally withering away in jail. Right, because uh, Nygaard K, which is the compound, mm -hmm. has gotten visited by Michael Jackson, Correct. George H.W. Bush, Robert De Niro, and a name that you've heard before in these types of circles, Prince Andrew. Correct. <laughs> who was also tied to the Jeffrey Epstein Correct. situation. Well, the... Nygaard and Epstein, is there any connection between the two? Not specifically that I've seen. Nygaard and, Prince An Nygaard and Prince Andrew, it's been alleged that Prince Andrew had visited Nygaard's compound. Uh, to what extent, I can't tell you at this moment. Got it. Uh, crazy story. You know, and then when Unbelievable. You see it's, 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 I mean, it's... You couldn't make it up. And it was in the course of putting the story together, I mean, there were days that that it seemed like it was a, it was a game of 3D chess. There were so many moving parts. Uh, lawyers with civil suits, victims who may or may not want to talk. It literally took two years to put this together from first finding out that you know this story existed and there was something to look into. And thanks to the very brave survivors and victims, uh, ranging from the young women in the Bahamas to supermodels here in LA, in the LA area, who had the courage to speak up, we were able to put this story together. But you guys weren't the reason why he got indicted. 
No, I, I think we were not unhelpful. <laughs> uh, and we're not the only human beings who've reported on this. The New York Times did a big story. Uh, the CBC has done reporting. But he was able to use his money and power to effectively silence a lot of this. I mean, he intimidated a lot of people. And there were threats. There were payoffs to government officials in the Bahamas. Mm. Um, Canada has much more restrictive laws involving the Fifth Estate. And um, he was able to keep it silent for a very long time. And again, um, he was charged and arrested uh, on December 15th of 2020. And I'm sure it was not, you know, unknown by investigators that we were getting ready to do a story. But I, I, they, they knew that there was a big case here and they knew that they had to go after him. Well, what's next for you? We are looking at a number of other stories like the Nygaard story, like the Onision story. I think there's a real bright future at Discovery Plus. We've got the podcast that's into episode six, Predators I've Caught. Uh, the YouTube channel. We're doing the predator investigations again. Um, as I mentioned, we just did another one in Michigan. That's going to be not only on the YouTube channel, but we're in discussions with a couple networks about a television series there and a lot of other just really exciting projects. It's a, it's a good time um, with a lot going on. So I'm, I'm very excited about it all. Well, I mean, Chris, congratulations on a, on a long storied career. Uh, you know, To Catch a Predator sort of has become just part of U.S. history at this point. It's well, it become has. iconic. You know, and, and look, you can, and I have this discussion, you know, both the boys are in the business, one behind the scenes doing production and camera and that sort of thing, and one is on camera. And, and you know, we talk about it. And, you know, at one point you think you're headed towards one sort of thing, and then you get involved in the Predator something that becomes so iconic. And so you either embrace it and use it for all the good it it can bring, or you spend time running away from it to do more mainstream things. So you embrace it and you use that that power and that energy to do, you know, really good stories, really good television, important media stuff. Yeah. I mean, I don't think people realize how tough the job that you and I have. To, to put our necks out, to ask the tough questions, to get the uncomfortable stories, to to be in uncomfortable and dangerous situations. Well, you're exactly right. And it's 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 not for everybody. No, it's not. You know, it just isn't. <laughs> Definitely and, not. And, uh, and it was tailor-made for me, though. I, I still get up 40 years into it every day and, and, and love what I do and am excited about the new projects. And... and um, you know, there's just a lot of great stuff going on. People always ask, well, how have you, you know, done it at this level for so many years? And I said, well, you know, part of it is just being too stupid to realize there's anything you can't do and don't place limits on yourself. Um, you know, I've also been blessed with working, uh, you know, with tremendously talented, creative, clever people who know how to harness my energy. Um, and with very few missteps in 40 years, I, I count myself very fortunate. Well, congratulations on everything. Well, and thank the, you, Vlad. And the eight it. Emmys on top ten, of that. actually. Oh, it's 10 now. Oh, I got it wrong the first time. You didn't even correct me. 10 Emmys. <laughs> 10 Emmys. 10 Emmys. Hopefully 11 or 12 before the next year is out. There you go. Uh, you know, I'm going to check out the Peter Nygaard. Yeah, uh, Peter Nygaard, well. Unseemly with Peter Nygaard on Discovery Plus, Onision in real life on mm -hmm. Discovery Plus, the YouTube channel, Have a Seat with Chris Hansen, and uh, the podcast. That's what it is. Until next time. Peace.